I'm Bob Dickey, and welcome to another episode of Taking the Leap Podcast. My guest today is my good friend, Hervé Laurent. Hervé is the founder and CEO of Hervé.io, an enterprise that builds, supports, and advises Web 3.0 companies. As a blockchain and Bitcoin enthusiast since 2013, Hervé became one of the very first crypto miners in the United States before listing the proceeds in public vehicles with Grayscale. He's advised over a dozen world-renowned projects, including Horizon Labs and the creation of Yuga Labs, ApeCoin, Decentraland, and the creation of the largest commercial zone in the metaverse and Horizon Zen Token. He's been profiled in many publications around the globe, such as Cointelegraph, Forbes, Bloomberg Magazine, the American Express Spotlight Series, and the Huffington Post. He's also appeared on numerous TV shows, including Bloomberg, KTLA, and E! News. He's a highly sought after speaker on the international stage for his expertise in this growing sector of the economy, having spoken at over 30 different conferences in 10 countries. Prior to founding his companies, Hervé worked at LVMH and Pernod Ricard. He's a graduate of the Harvard Business School President's Program and has an MBA from Columbia Business School. He's also a member of the Young Presidents Organization, also known as YPO. I'm excited to hear what he has to share about the recent developments in this very exciting space. So let's jump right in. Well, Airbay, my friend, I tell you what, we have been waiting quite a while for you to be able to join the pod. Just a second ago, we were talking about how many of our mutual friends have been asking for you to be a guest on the podcast. And I tell you what, the, the timing couldn't be any better. I mean, you are an expert in the world of cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies. And my goodness, we have entered 2024 with all sorts of news and fanfare. But before we get into kind of like your predictions and your outlook in 2024, there's so many people that I feel would like to understand your background on how you got involved in this space. And I think it rewinds all the way back to about 2013, if I'm not mistaken. I, I heard a recent podcast where you shared a little bit of your story, but could you give us just a, a brief background of how you got introduced to cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies and how it brings you up to today? Yeah, no, thank you. And, it, and it's great to uh, to see one of my uh, Harvard classmates and, and to be doing this uh, with you. So thanks for having me uh, on the pod. Um, yeah, so... Uh, you know, nothing at the beginning brought me even remotely close to that to that direction. So I was born from a French dad uh, and a Venezuelan mother. We were living in Paris, and my father was in the, the wine and spirit business. In fact, my grandfather also was in that business and started after World War II, uh, invented the wine filter. So I grew up in a, you know, wine family um, and then my dad became one of the largest distributors of wines and spirit in, in Canada. Uh, and I started my career at LVMH and their wine and spirit division. So I was, uh, uh, you know, as much of a traditional business guy uh, that you can imagine. But on the other side of my family uh, from Venezuela, um, they've witnessed an economy that collapsed. And, um, you know, when the economy collapses, when you have high inflations and when your credit card uh, doesn't go through, you need to find uh, a plan B. And uh, the plan B is plan Bitcoin. Hmm. And uh, that's where in 2013, my Venezuelan mother asked me to send money to Venezuela. At that time, my brother and I, our best idea when we were in New York was go to JFK uh, with U.S. dollars, drop it to Caracas, the capital of Venezuela, Hmm. and to come back. And that's where... Uh, a friend of mine said, well, why don't you send Bitcoin? Uh, and at that time, Bitcoin was at $70. And uh, and that's where I started going down the rabbit hole. Well, and, and I, it's funny as I, you share that story, as I... I remember, I'm going to tell a little uh, a story about you introducing all of our classmates to cryptocurrencies, but I, I remember the early days of this kind of taking off in the United States, and there were so many people uh, here in the U.S. that just, they, they couldn't wrap their minds around it. They couldn't understand, it. like, well, why do you need it? And as an individual who had traveled extensively uh, throughout uh, Asia and Africa and Europe, but primarily I, I saw the the problems that people had in remittances across the globe to various locales, and I saw how people, specifically in, in the continent of Africa, were utilizing cryptocurrencies 
um, for remittance payments. And I'm like, okay, hold on. You may not see the use case here in the U.S. just yet, but this is taking the world by storm. It is solving real-world problems. Um, so to, to hear that that was exactly how you, you got involved in the space where you were, you know, trying to figure out how to move a currency globally and it, to your friends and family. It, it, that was exactly what I was seeing as well at the time. Now, let me tell you a, a quick story. I remember, I, I want to say this probably was about, it had to have been 2013, 2014, and you had a presentation uh, during one of our classes where you rolled a Bitcoin miner out on a, a little cart and in front of the class, do you remember this? And you gave, and it was it was a small group of people during one of our lunch sessions. You said, "Hey, I want to tell you guys a little bit about this." And so, a handful of people showed up, and you were giving a master class on what was going on. And I could see it. I mean, myself, I'm scratching my head, like, "What is this?" Do you, Do you remember that presentation that you gave? And t tell me your um, the response you got from our classmates in those very early days, because I know so many of those people who were in that classroom now understand it and get it much better than they did back in like 2013 or 2014. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that, that's a great point. And I remember that, that day perfectly when, um, you know, a, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, I think it was the, the class was reflective of, of the general population. Some mm -hmm. people got very excited about building a new monetary system. Other were skeptical. And most of them were saying, well, maybe uh, but let's see what the what the future brings, mm -hmm. and let's see if if you're right or not. Um, and, and I think that you know, for for a lot of a lot of people, it's understanding cryptocurrency, especially in Venezuela, was the difference between having a meal at night or or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and for others, you know, it is it is more of a I would say a, a, an intellectual exercise to see well. You know, is blockchain technology actually uh, a thing? Um, but when you look at, you know, the world, there's 193 currencies in the world and the bottom 60 collapse. And I think that's the target market. The target mm -hmm. market is um, people who have mistrust uh, in their own government. And, you know, when I look at the monetary policies, I couldn't be able to tell you uh, the monetary policy even of, you know, the G8 countries. However, I can tell you the monetary policy of Bitcoin, you know, till the year 2140. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of the time, um, the success also of, um, of, of, of you know, um, technology um, without um, intermediate uh, that can play around with it is also um, the collapse mm -hmm. of, of other systems uh, and the mistrust towards them. And, and in fact, uh, we see countries that decided to develop, including Venezuela, to develop their own digital currency, and the digital currency collapsed. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that if you mistrust your government, you're going to mistrust as well them creating something digital. Mm -hmm. uh, so something digital is not uh, the way, um, you know, it's not, it's not the proof that everything is going to be perfect, but having something decentralized that is rely on mathematics um, is, um, is is something that is, um, you know, a gauge of certainty uh, for a lot of people. Like we say, you know, the math is the math is the math. It's mm -hmm. very hard to debate uh, facts. Opinions can be de 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 uh, de debated, uh, but facts have the tendency to be extremely stubborn. Yes. And uh, you know, I, I realize that uh, the average lifespan of a currency is 40 years old. And from the day that I was born to now, I was born on the Bolivar, my Venezuelan side, that doesn't exist anymore. And I was born on the, with the French franc on, you know, my, my Parisian side, mm -hmm. and, and that doesn't exist anymore. So the both currencies from the moment that I was born to now don't exist. Right. And now we can argue that, well, some currencies exist, but they lost with inflation a vast amount of their, their purchasing powers. And we don't even have to go, you know, very far from it. If you look at the numbers from five years ago to, to now, um, we realized that uh, often case, we're never going to reverse the, the debt of, of the country itself, and that it's running in a very, very, um, it, it's running towards towards the wall. So what I think at the beginning, my, um, you know, my, my, my the, the big narrative uh, out there was that Bitcoin specifically uh, was an insurance policy um, against, you know, the 
um, the, the traditional system. Mm -hmm. And I was saying to people, you should put 5% of your net worth in, in, in Bitcoin in case the rest collapses. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you know, in, in case it goes to, to a million dollars. It's as an insurance policy. And we have seen that an insurance policy has paid off yeah. because of the mismanagement of, uh, of some of the, uh, of the monetary policies out there. Hervé, there is a really interesting point that you just made a second ago because you see all these countries are like, oh, we're going to have our own digital currency. And you're like, hey, if you, if, if you don't trust the, 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 the country, if you don't trust the government, if they've mismanaged the economy, just because they issue a digital currency doesn't mean all of a sudden people are going to trust that as well. Um, that's why you need something else that is immutable that people are going to, to trust. And I want to uh, dig into that a little bit further, but before we get too uh, far away from uh, the conversation that we had about your time, I wanted I want to maybe double click on that moment in time because it was something that was very interesting that I that I saw about you uh, during that presentation. So here you are, you walk into a classroom with a group of presidents and CEOs from around the world, and most of the people that were listening and watching your presentation didn't have a understanding of what was going on. You had deep, deep conviction. You're at, at that moment in time, you're at the cutting edge. You have insight and understanding. And the vast majority of the people who were watching did not. And you, you are living currently still, and we're going to get to all the various projects that you're working on, uh, all the various Web3 companies that you're you're helping and supporting and you're on, on boards, but you live at the cutting edge of technology and innovation globally. And when you do that, you're, you're so far ahead of, let's say, the general populace who doesn't have an understanding of all of those types of things. Tell me about the psychology as an entrepreneur, as a business leader, where you are living there, because you know I've discovered, and I think that you would uh, agree with this, that um, where, where there's a lot of friction, where there's a lot of misunderstanding, it's also a place of, of great, a great deal of opportunity. But it can be difficult to live in those environments because so many of your peers, friends, uh, contemporaries are like scratching their head like, what's going on? I don't get it. I don't see it. It's, it, it can be a very difficult environment for an entrepreneur and a business leader to live in. How, do, how did you manage that Psycholo uh, psychologically for yourself? Um, and then helping people along the way understand and get a better uh, grip of what was going on because you, you were very passionate show, sharing with them this am amazing opportunity that was being born. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a great question, and I, and I would answer it in, in three phases. The, the first one um, is that th there was a real case study. Mm -hmm. This was this not um, you know speculation on a token that you know I would hope would go out go higher in value. Uh, this solved a real problem that I had. And I realized, well, what's the size of the opportunity of that problem? If I had that problem, I might not be the only one to have it. So when I look at the size of the remittance uh, industry, which was the first case study that I looked for for, for Bitcoin, I realized that it was a, a massive category. You know, you have, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, very large uh, companies, banks, entities, credit card companies that, that are in that business. And I thought, well, if they get, you know, a very small part of that business, that would make it a success. That was number one. The number two part, the second part of it, is that I realized between what the smartest people were saying, uh, the smartest people in blockchain and in technology were saying about it versus what was written from you know mainstream publication, I realized that there was a large gap. I realized that you know they weren't capturing what um, the um, they weren't capturing what the industry was um, what was actually about, and I realized that there was a lot of misconceptions. Some of the misconceptions were, uh, oh, Bitcoin is used you know, by terrorists and, you know, you know, and, and people doing illicit activities. And when you realize that the FBI at the same time says, I'd rather every criminal to use Bitcoin because we can catch them in a matter of minutes uh, because it's all traceable in the blockchain, you, you realize, well, there's a big gap go going on. Um, and we usually when there's this gap, it's called FUD uh, in, in, the, in the crypto industry, the fur, uh, fear and, and uncertainty. Where, where you, you realize that, well, if, if that course corrects, 
thereby mean an increase um, in, in, in the value of it. And I would say the third point uh, around it is, is purely from a macro standpoint that the world is going digital. So when you realize Web 1, Web 2, Web 3, you realize that we went from Web 1 that was read-only, so this is typically when you go on Yahoo, check the weather or the sports results, to Web 2, which is basically right now we're at the end of the era of Web 2 going into Web 3, which is read and write. So, you know, your typical, you know, Facebook, um, Google, et cetera, where you can interact um, between, um, um, you know, w- within, within your browser. And then mm-hmm. Web3, you add the digital ownership to it. And the reason why you don't have digital ownership in Web2 is that back when, um, you know, in the, in the 2000s, Web2 was being built, you didn't have blockchain technology. You had the traditional internet. And at that time, the traditional internet was around a business model on advertising. So mm-hmm. as they say, if you get the product for free, that means you're the product. And that's why Web2 is. You get the product for free. They use the data to sell to you or target it out towards that. And I believe there's a better way to do that. First of all, I believe that the internet has been built poorly because of that, because Mm -hmm. the revenue of the internet shouldn't be getting your data and reselling your data. And now you have that notion of, of digital ownership. So, you know, I thought to myself, well, you know, is the internet here to stay? I say, yes. Is blockchain internet better than traditional internet? Well, well, yes, it's faster, cheaper. Um, and then thirdly, do we believe that there's going to be an element of digital ownership in the future that we are going to believe that things that we cannot touch has value? And then we realize that, yes, you know, now in people's mind, if you say, hey, where well, you rather have $100 cash or a Bitcoin, I think everybody would say, I'd rather have a Bitcoin because that's worth, you know, $42,000. And now we understand the element of digital ownership. And I believe that the next decade will be the, the decade focusing on digital ownership. It truly is amazing. If you take a look at uh, how Bitcoin, I, I, someone sent me a, a graphic of the top currencies and investments that you could have made over the last decade. And Bitcoin by far uh, appreciated in value more so than anything else, whether you were looking at the, the Dow Jones, the S&P 500, Apple stock, Amazon stock, Netflix, you you name it. Uh, it was it was. Uh, an outsized appreciation in value over the, the, the last decade, the, the number one um, asset that you could have held. So I agree with you. I think there's a lot of people now would be like, hey, if you get $100 of U.S. currency or $100 of Bitcoin, I'll take the Bitcoin. Uh, I love the fact that you uh, early on were looking at not speculation, but you were really being logical, analytical. You were looking at a, pr- a problem uh, that needed to be solved uh, analyzing it from a standpoint, it's like, hey, this is a an enormous problem globally. Therefore, this is probably a, a place where I can invest some time and energy, learn about this, invest in this, build this out, because there's a uh, a, a runway of opportunity there. So I, I see a lot of entrepreneurs today as we're entering into 2024 that are doing the exact same thing. They're looking for problems that need to be solved uh, domestically, globally, is this a problem that's going to persist for a lot of people for a, a long time? And all right, well, this is a, a great opportunity for me to invest time and learn and become an expert. Now, you're doing this in, specifically in the the cryptocurrency and the blockchain technology space. Uh, you now going all the, from 2013, 2014 till today uh, have become a a specialist in this space, one of the top voices in uh, the industry. I'm following you as you go around the world and speak at all these various symposiums and conferences. You're on the board of uh, multiple uh, global projects. What are some of the things that that you see right now that you're most excited about as we're entering into 2024? Um, And I know you'll probably uh, talk about some of the projects that you're intimately involved in, but can you give folks um, a little insight into uh, into 2024 when we've had a a little bit of a rocky uh last couple of years we went through you know there was this great appreciation and run up in 20 uh 2020 and 2021 and then we've gone through a little bit of a crypto winter people are excited about the new launch of the etfs that finally got passed here in in the united states give us 
your insider's insight of what's going on currently and what your predictions and what, what what's the, the roadmap forward that excites you? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, there's a, there's a lot of, of exciting things, but, but first, you know, a, a lot of people are often surprised. Um, you know, I, I'm a Warren Buffett, uh, disciple and, and, and really, uh, follow a lot of his, his philosophy, which is quite ironic because Warren Buffett, uh, is not a, definitely not a crypto guy, uh, definitely not a web two guy. You know, mm-hmm. he, his best friend is, 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 uh, Bill Gates that he never invested in, in Microsoft. Um, but I would say that th- there's a couple of very rational elements around that. The, the first one is that um, you have to invest in things that you understand. Uh, mm-hmm. My overexposure in Bitcoin uh, or in any other you know, cryptos is that I fundamentally spend my 10,000 hours understanding it and seeing mm-hmm. uh, under the hood. So that's the first Warren Buffett principle I'm applying. And then the second thing is that Warren Buffett is focusing on, on value investing and linear growth. What I think of one of the big misconceptions that's related to blockchain in general is the concept of network effects and the concept of Metcalf's law. And the first time that that really came up is um, when I looked at the purchase of uh, WhatsApp by Facebook. It was purchased for $19 billion. At the end, you know, everybody actually thought it was a typo. They thought it was $1.9 billion, but it came out as, as $19 billion. When we realized that this company that had 70 engineers and no revenue, the value of it was the value of the network. It's the same thing as a telephone line, the traditional telephone line. Once you have one telephone, it has a value. When you have two telephones, it's not one plus one, it's one square. Then when you have two telephones, it's two square, et cetera. So it's an exponential growth. And we have often difficulty understanding exponential growth as our the human brain is really built for linear growth. So when we see those big curves, our automatic feeling is, oh, it's a Ponzi scheme, it's a tulip bubble, and, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to collapse. But when you look at it, you're going to have one network effect that owns the majority. I mean, it's, it's the case with, you know, with, with, uh, with, with, with Facebook or, or with Instagram. The number one is worth, you know, 100 billions. The number two is worth 10 billion because mm-hmm. it's a winner take, takes all elements. Um, to, to come back to, to your question in terms of what is exciting in 2024, um, I, I think after 10 years in the industry, uh, we've reached a new level, which is um, institutional demand. Um, you know, most the money in the world is owned by, um, you know, people over 60 years old and institutions. And mm-hmm. these have on the sidelines of crypto, um, you know, from, from the beginning. Uh, and it's quite interesting because when you look at traditional businesses, it used to be, you know, you have an entrepreneur, he raises money from high net worth individuals, then he goes to VCs, then he goes to institutions, and then dumps the the equity towards the retail investors. Here you actually have the exact opposite. You have retail investors who come in, who might or might not be as knowledgeable um, you know, in other sphere, but actually are very knowledgeable when it relates to um, to crypto because some of them live and breathe this and they're at an age where they grew up with the internet and the notion of digital uh, ownership when you played, you know, years, you know, Roblox or Fortnite and understand that a digital sword actually has value is an easy transition um, to actually do. So what we realize is that um, you know, now you have the stamp of approval of the SEC who says, you know what, we've looked into it and now we're going to uh, offer an uh, institution the possibility to get in. And that that changes everything within the space itself. You know, it used to be when I started, you know, somebody who put it $100,000 in the space was considered a huge amount. Then, you know, a few years after, it was a million. Uh, now we're going to have guys institutions who are going to come with checks of a billion to, mm-hmm. to deploy. And and that is going to bring um, just the space to an entire different level. And I think it's, it is the case uh, in, the, in the U.S. And obviously, uh, everyone is looking at what, what the U.S. is doing. But the impact of the ETF in the U.S. also have a global repercussions because now you have Asian countries, you have African countries who are saying, oh, wait a minute, now we're going to reactivate our uh, ETF program because the U.S. says it was okay with them, therefore it's okay with us. Um, so we see that impact 
uh, on a worldwide basis. And uh, and I believe, you know, that, you know, we've seen the best performing asset class or the best performing asset uh, being Bitcoin uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, I believe that the new narrative for the next 10 years is also going to be Bitcoin. And the reason is, is a little bit different from, I would say, what we think the typical answer would be. We hear, I say, three elements of the typical answer. The first one is that, well, the ETF is approved, therefore it's going to be the best performing. That That's one part of it, and that's an important part. The second one is the Bitcoin halving, to say, hey, every four years we cut the supply by two. So now we're saying, well, actually, now you have large institutions coming in, and at the same time, we cut the supply by half. There's a supply shock that is going to come from that. So this is purely from a mathematic standpoint. Uh, th- this is this is going to happen. And also, there's also a, a, another interesting element is that a lot of the bitcoins actually have been lost uh, mm-hmm. since the beginning. You know, when bitcoins were worth you know twenty cents, a lot of people had them in their computer, threw it out, and and now you know these bitcoins can't can be found. In fact, the the, the the wallet of Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonym that invented uh, Bitcoin, was never touched. There's still the billions of dollars on it. Uh, mm-hmm. So did he pass away? Did he disappear? Is it a government? You know, there's there's wide speculation. Um, but the fact is, is that from zero to forty thousand dollars, he never took a dollar, uh, mm-hmm. which is you know which is questioning. So that's the second element. And then the third element is something that I'm really uh, passionate about is building on top of Bitcoin. So mm-hmm. if you was the rail, rail, railroad for, for a long time, uh, since 2017, where projects were built on top of Ethereum um, and the market cap of Ethereum of $300 billion and the market cap of tokens building on top of Ethereum was basically one-to-one, 300 mm-hmm. billion ERC-20s, $300 billion when it relates to, uh, to Ethereum. Right now, we see Bitcoin at a seven six hundred billion dollar market cap, and the value of tokens being built in top of Bitcoin is only a few billion dollars. Mm-hmm. So, if the same ecosystem that has developed of on top of Ethereum's becomes cut and paste and be, and and happens on top of Bitcoin, you have a potential of three hundred x of tokens being built. So, when I discovered this about a year ago. Um, it was it was March. It, it was in March, in March of uh, 2023, and I saw some tokens being built on it, mostly meme coins uh, that were built on top of, of Bitcoin. And I says, well, there's actually a quite an interesting uh, narrative around that. And I'm lucky that I live in Puerto Rico, and you know, a lot of uh, um, you know crypto native folks uh, mm-hmm. are based there, and some of them are um, you know on top of uh, of the trends in the industry and then i realized that they're replicating exactly what is being built on ethereum they're building it on bitcoin with two main benefits the first one you have a pool of liquidity that is the largest one in the world yeah. and number two you have the you have engineers with now years of experience it used to be on ethereum you know a couple of college kids building things and it was it was a new process for everyone now you have guys with 10 years of experience in the industry building on on bitcoin so the pace of innovation on top of this blockchain is extremely rapid to the point that we didn't have any brc20 tokens uh, in the top hundreds um, or, you know, uh, over the last couple of, of months. And now we have two of them. We have mm-hmm. two tokens that are built on top of Bitcoin inside of the top 100 market taps within the space. And when you look at the growth that is happening, um, it's it's extremely, extremely rapid. In fact, it's going faster than Ethereum at the same time. So if history, you know, replicates or rhymes, um, then we would have the largest value creations of token on top of the Bitcoin ecosystem, on top of a chain that is quote unquote approved by the government. So if today you you have a uh, real estate tokenization um, project, are you going to build it on top of you know what some call ghost chains with you know with not a lot of of traffic or liquidity or are you going to say wait a minute the the the, the US approved you know the bitcoin etf uh, there's a lot of liquidity on it 
hey, why don't we build on top of Bitcoin rather than building on top of the other chain? And I think that's, um, you know, one of the biggest opportunities that we have uh, for this year. Yeah, so there's this natural gravitational pull onto uh, the Bitcoin uh, blockchain, you know, I, and I, I saw that over the last couple of years where uh, uh, developers that I knew, people who were you know, uh, in the space like you, you know, they were very high on Ethereum for the, the ease of use and all the various things. But we're, we're now seeing a, a shift in some of those exact same things now happening over on Bitcoin. Tell me a little bit about the insights that you have earlier. You said, hey, I, I really wanted to focus in on some real world use cases and uh, problems that were being solved. What are some of the, the problems that you see being solved and how engineers and coders are developing some really cool uh, projects that you you believe have uh, long, you know, I guess, legs or an investment potential here over the over the future? What are the what are those you know areas where real world problems are being solved in um, with blockchain technology? Yeah, so, so so it's quite interesting because um, in in uh, in this industry we have um, the we evaluate the technology, and then there is the hype, mm -hmm. and and often you know some of them there's there are, there are major discrepancies. So you know we're coming out of a bear market. I mean last year Bitcoin was at fifteen thousand dollars. Today is at forty two thousand. When Bitcoin was at fifteen thousand. Uh, there was no activity within within the crypto space in general. Everybody was struggling to raise their next rounds. Uh, it kind of washed off a lot of projects that maybe didn't have the utility that the market wanted. And therefore, um, you know, only the real case scenario. We often say in our industry that if you haven't gone, like there's some VCs that says, I'm not looking at projects that haven't gone through a bear market, you mm -hmm. know, because that, that's where you see if it has the, the, the stomach um, to uh, to you know to to go through it. Um, so yeah, so I, I would say that um, in terms of real problems, there there are um, there I would say from a macro level what everybody is waiting for, which is um, tokenization are basically everything uh, from real estate, which is the biggest store of value in the world, uh, to stocks, to bonds, etc. I think that's the direction where the world is going. We're going to have everything tokenized. Uh, but that, I would say, is a medium to long-term view. Uh, there are short-term views at the moment. And one of them, a very exciting narrative for 2024, is gaming, video gaming. Mm -hmm. um, and gaming uh, is the natural evolution for, for Web3. Um, why? Because you already have a customer base, a user base, that understands the space. You don't need to sell them about you know, the internet and digital assets and trading digital assets, they already know it. And mm -hmm. when the difference between owning digital assets in a Web2 company versus Web3, Web3, on a Web2 company, well, actually the company owns the digital assets. So if you're on Xbox, you have digital assets, well, it's owned by Microsoft. On a Web3 game, when you have a digital asset, it's actually owned by the user itself. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with extra there's there's two does it come with extra issues which is now you have the custody of this asset that means if you lose it you don't have a customer support service that you can call to get it back so, so you know the, you, you might have heard the, the the famous sentence um not not your keys not your coins well this yeah. is a little bit the, the same thing if you don't if if you don't take care of it like if you don't take care of your cash and it disappears, well, there's nothing that, you know, you're not going to call the central bank to get it back. It's it's done. It's gone. Um, so that's that's the, the number one thing. And the number two things that gaming um, missed, uh, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, the, 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 the gaming takes time. The average lifespan of creating a game is seven years. So mm -hmm. if you go full speed to develop a blockbuster game, it's seven years. Um, so we haven't gone through that cycle. So what um, what had happened is that some game was pushed through um, that never had a real audience. That the reason why they were being used was more from play to earn type dynamics. So if I play, I cap they capture my attentions and I get rewarded for that. Yeah. But that doesn't mean the game is fun. That right. just means the revenue model um, for certain 
you know, uh, segment of the population. Well, they say, you know what? I'd rather spend three hours, even if it's not fun. At least we're making money with it. And it's kind of a, like a, a second, uh, it's kind of a side hustle. Like that's that's what. I- now, isn't that what was going on uh, specifically like in Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Axie Infinity, right? So there's a lot of people who it was almost like a job for them. Hey, I'm going to go on this this uh, this game and I'm, I can play and I'm, I'm earning uh, uh, as well. I mean, I heard a lot of stories coming out of the Philippines specifically on that. Um, but it's, it, it was a little bit different than, say, like my kids who are wanting to sit down and play Halo uh, or uh, Call of Duty or, you know, Madden football or something right here in, in the U.S., right? Yeah. And, and, and yeah, exactly. And, and a, not only a game has to be fun, but the rest of your friends have to be in the game. Like yes. the value of the Roblox and Fortnite is, is the network, is that mm-hmm. all your friends are there. I remember going to um, uh, the son of uh, of one of my friends' um, uh, room, and and I was like, "Oh, your your son is playing alone on his computer." And the dad says, "No, he's with all his classmates." Mm-hmm. You know, um, so you know, I was expecting seeing all his classmates in the room with him, but he was alone uh, in, in front in front of the, in front of the screen. And and I would also argue that now you have a whole generation that has been going through the pandemic that you know that become even a faster learning curve because they had, you know, to socialize with, with their devices. Now we could argue that, you know, that, that might have not been, um, you know, the, the pushing somebody to do that through, through, um, through measures uh, imposed might, might not be uh, uh, the best way. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, the, the result is that uh, it has created these online communities and these online communities are very active and these online communities um, have very strong relationships. So I, I, I'm lucky enough to have been voted in by one of the largest uh, of this community, which is the, the Boarded Yacht Club uh, community and the, and the Ape Coin. So, so there's four, 142,000 um, uh, holders uh, that vote to see who are their representative uh, towards the community. So myself and four other members uh, have been mo- voted in for, for this term. So it's a little bit like a, like a presidential elections where you have yeah. to go country by country and, and convince the delegates uh, to, to, vote, uh, um, to vote for you and bring up a plan on, on how uh, you will respect the will of the community and, and pushing it forward. And, um, and I was always amazed to see how, how strong that, that community is. Uh, and the ideas that that are coming, and then often when we have conversation, uh, it sounds almost cliche, but it's it's the answers are are within, and in that mm-hmm. case, is within the community. We don't need to go very far to have the brightest people, but that you know crowd element that finds solution uh, is 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 quite amazing, and um, and and yeah, and that's something that we need to develop. It's both not only having the best idea, the best technology, but also the strongest community. And without the strongest community, your project is uh, is not worth much. It's so interesting that you highlight the community aspect, right? So, um, and I and I, I've watched you as you've traveled around the world, as you're talking at all these conferences. Uh, right now, you're calling in from Cape Town. Uh, you, you spend time uh, all over the globe. You'll be in Paris here pretty soon. Now, let's double click a little bit on the, on the power of community, right? You, you talked about these uh, new games that had been uh, developed in Web3 and some of the ones that you and I have talked about in the past, Decentraland, uh, Axie Infinity, and I'm, I'm probably missing a couple others that you've worked with. But you said that the, the value is that when you're, you, your friends need to be there, people need to be there, when they have a community that's as active and engaged as, say, Fortnite, Halo, Call of Duty, those types of games that we're uh, very uh, familiar with globally, that you just you can see the value of it exploding. My kids uh, instantly understand uh, about the tokenization of games and, you know, buying, like they trade and buy stuff in, in the various games that they're playing all the time. They're used to it. So uh, do you see that some of these games that are being developed in Web3 are going to end up having similar type of um, a global footprint of fans like some of these other, maybe Microsoft or, you know, the Xbox games or the, the PlayStation games? Uh, do you see a, a similar uh, correlation there? Yeah, so so the gaming industry is is a difficult industry. It's a little bit like uh, you know being a a movie producer in Hollywood. You know, are you going to have the next big blockbuster or not? Um, 
so so there is there is a, a very strong pipeline uh, of games that, that I see. And that is going to be 2024 is really going to be the first test. Okay. Um, the two major players uh, within our, our, our space are uh, Yugo Labs. So the company that had uh, raised $500 million from A16Z behind, you know, Board of Yacht Club um, and the other side, the metaverse. Um, they're developing uh, a lot of games. Mm-hmm. And now here is going to be the, ge- the year that they're going to release those games. Uh, so now is the first Web3 company with a massive budget that can actually compete uh, with, with these, you know, Web2 games. And in fact, the CEO of Yugo Labs um, used to be the president of Activation Blizzard, uh, one of oh, the wow. largest you know, gaming companies in the world. So it kind of gives a hint where the direction is, is going. Uh, yeah. The other one, which is a, a conglomerate within our space, which is Animoca Brands, who has 450 portfolio companies, have a number of games that are ready to be launched. Um, so this is going to be the real test to see, you know, what the what the large entities within uh, our, our space and the ones who are able to fund games and the marketing behind it and the token launches around it, uh, how actually that's going to be received uh, from from the community. But there's also the aspect of not only it's within the Web3 space, but, you know, the Web3 space. Uh, being big in the Web3 space is like being the tallest midget. I mean, it, it, it is still a very small industry. Uh, mm-hmm. What we have that off-ramp from Web2 games to, to Web3 uh, and to have an exodus of millions of people um, coming in uh, the space and, and growing that that community. So uh, that's something that I'm that I'm very excited about. Let's talk a little bit about the leadership roles that you are in currently. You, you mentioned that you know you've uh, just been elected uh, to be on the board of I believe it was it's Yuga Labs and ApeCoin and Board Ape Yacht Club. Anybody who's been in the crypto space for any amount of time uh, knows of these iconic brands and and uh, the things that they're doing. So it's quite a global achievement for you to be elected to be in this um, leadership role uh, of these global projects. And I'm curious, I mean, you and I have sat through so many classes and to talk about, you know, leading teams, uh, leading communities of people. And here you are, you're in a leadership role of a web of multiple Web3 projects. And uh, what are you noticing that's similar or different? from other leadership roles that you've had uh, in your career? I mean, you, you had one of your, your, your starts, you worked at LVMH, um, you know, uh, other iconic brands that are more kind of traditional. Uh, and so here you are in this, in this new role. I'm curious of what you're learning, uh, what insights that you have in these, in these various leadership roles, what's similar, what may be different? Yeah, so, so it, it, it's actually quite, quite interesting because um, being on, on Web3 projects, um, in community Web3 projects, it, it's more of a, uh, it, it's closer uh, to politics than it is to, to business. So you need to be, to have the business uh, understanding, but at the end, uh, you're being voted in and you need to be followed uh, by, by the community. If mm-hmm. the community says, you know what, uh, we don't, we don't follow, uh, that y- your project is dead. And, and in fact, when you look at for example, Vitalik, who um, who um, founded Ethereum, uh, who's who's the the mind behind it. Um, you know, he doesn't present himself as the CEO or the founder, etc. He's presenting himself as one of the community members mm-hmm. because he knows that if the community doesn't, um, you know, rally behind the Ethereum project, the Ethereum project has a chance to be a ghost chain very rapidly. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I talk to individuals we need to find when i talk to community members it's about n- number one what is um what are the trends that we either are coming up that we're missing what are the movements that are ha- that are happening within a space that we need to be aware of and how do we actually build it so we're living in my situation between a world of of the, the world of centralization because the world is centralized mm-hmm. people need to want to know Who's the person they're talking to? You know, what's their business address? You know, what corporation that is? That's the way, you know, which jurisdiction you're in. Um, you know, governments wants to know that. You can't say, well, I'm launching a, 
a decentralized project and, you know, we don't obey by any, any, any rules. Um, you know, they, they are, we're living in a world where, where there are rules and we're living in a world of, um, that we're building that is a borderless world. So mm. more a world where it's all about decentralization, all about community voting, all about, you know, members from uh, all over the, all over the world. Uh, you know, one of the hardest things just to do board meetings is that we're, we couldn't be more opposite in terms of time zones. Uh, mm -hmm. We have our you know, one, the board member from China with the board member of Europe with the board. Member. So it's it's it shows how how global that is. And you know, uh, we're we're in five different jurisdictions, and the entity is in another one, and it's not even an entity; it's a foundation. And then you know, we're putting votes out by by the community. So I think it's the difficulty is to be in between. Two different, two different environments, and you have to speak both languages. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when you know the, the the odd times that you know we talk to, or not the odd times, but you know the, the times where we talk to um, centralized, uh, or we talk to governments, or we talk to representatives, or we talk to, um, or we talk to uh, uh, you know organizations and and companies, uh, we need to have a certain language. Uh, mm -hmm. We can't tell them, ah, oh, we're in the cloud and you know, uh, you know, you only live once and let's launch project, etc. <laughs> YOLO, as they say. Uh, yeah. No, that, that's not the language that they obey, they, 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 they understand. Or, or for that matter, just pitching uh, even a crypto VC. Uh, you right. can't really use, you know, that, that language to have real stakeholders uh, putting money who have a fiduciary duty towards their investors. Um, but at the same time, we're living internally in a Web3 world where we're reinventing the rules, where mm -hmm. we're saying, hey, let's launch, you know, uh, another world where we're going to live in on Mars and we only have going to swap, you know, between different cryptocurrencies and we're going to be able to, you know, duplicate ourselves in a, in a separate world. And so so it, it is in some way, um, we often say that you need a, a Web3 passport to go from, from one to the other. Mm -hmm. And I said one of the things that it, it learns is, is really to understand your, your audience and, and not to lose people. And I think um, one of the things that, you know, uh, the, 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 the concrete business elements that you and I uh, learn at, at HBS was, 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 a, um, was a language that um, um, was the language of business and mm -hmm. the language of business that we can switch on and off and being able to be understood by, by other members, even if they think, well, that idea is actually uh, crazy. But, you know, the way that he explains it, you know, maybe at least or, uh, you know, 10 years ago when, when, you know, I first started to go to the exercise or or even when I was doing presentation about it, I think people were saying, well, it, it sounds wacky, but it's not absurd. I mean, right. it sounds like a bit of a stretch, but maybe, maybe there could be something behind it. And, and this is something where, I don't think, at least it, it got it got into the conversation and not being completely discounted. Now, the level of the discount, you know, really depends on the person. Some actually took, you know, I remember my some of my, um, you know, cl close mates who, uh, when I told them about the first ICOs of the metaverse in 2017, uh, thought, you know what, let's, let's go for it and did, you know, very well with it. Uh, and others might say, you know what, I, I just don't need it. I, and I just, even if it kind of makes sense, it's, it's, it's for me too, too far. And I think that now we're at an interesting time where I think for, for a long period of time, um, we kind of felt that there was the options not to learn about it, to be able to say, you know what, this is a fad, it's going to disappear in three years and it's going to be gone. And you know that whole crypto chapter was just you know a little a little blink in in you know in the technology world now with the approval of DTF with the you know hundreds of millions of wallets that are open it kind of feels like well we actually need to learn it because it might stick around for a while and even if it's not um you know uh um a a a, a path of investments or i'm not going to spend 
you know, the time to select the investments. Well, at least for my general knowledge, I need to learn the basics around it and and probably even still have a little bit in my portfolio just in case. And I think that um, that right now we pass from that just in case moment to now a certainty that is that is here to stay. That's very interesting. Um, I, one of the things that I find so fascinating is your uh, the leadership position and role that you're playing specifically at the cutting edge of new and emerging technologies, which is requiring you to toggle back and forth between kind of traditional uh, economy and business and this cutting edge economy and business. And it requires a great deal of, uh, I think, self-awareness to under, you have to be able to understand both worlds. You've got to be able to communicate in both worlds and you have to have the self-awareness to understand, be like, Hey, I get this. I've got my 10,000 or even in your case, maybe 20,000 hours now, uh, in this emerging technology, but I, I'm going to have to be able to uh, know when and how to speak to somebody who doesn't quite have this knowledge and help bring them along. Um, and so you're, you're, it's like it's very, very difficult for you to be able to toggle back and forth between these two worlds. And I, I, I work with entrepreneurs who do the same uh, in other industries, uh, and it, it presents a, a really unique leadership challenge. Well, I think one of the things that both you and I also learned, uh, there's some universal principles in business. And I'd like for you to highlight this because I, for you to be elected into these senior roles globally, leading these communities, one of the things that you and I both learned was that a part of the language of business is trust. And when you have trust, a trust of people, uh, you, obviously as a leader, you need to have vision. So they're, they're buying into your vision. You're seeing something in the future. You're seeing a pathway of where the world is going, where there's opportunity. But if people don't buy into and trust you, uh, or the vision, it's going to be very hard for you, the board, to, to get ver things done. How in, in this very diverse uh, group of um, people that you're leading and the, the roles that you're playing, can you explain what you've learned about trust, how to build trust, how to keep trust, how to gain trust? How important is trust in everything that you're doing? I'd, I'd like to see, you're just hear from you, bird's eye view of maybe what you've uh, learned uh, around that in these particular projects. Yeah, so so it's it's quite interesting in the in the Web three space because the swings are very big from going up and, and going down. You know, mm -hmm. you wake up one day, you're down eighty percent, and you know, and you wake up the following day, and you're you're ten x. Uh, yeah. The, the, so so with these bigs of a swing, it's actually quite easy to see who's committed or not to the space. And mm -hmm. I think the trust element, some of the time, some of the things that we forget is the commitment element. Who's actually mm -hmm. committed to this? When it's a bear market, when it's rainy outside, when you know there's no financing, do you actually believe in it, mm -hmm. in the space? And are you gonna come up still with, you know, a smile on your face and, you know, coming on the Zoom calls and making the extra effort, you know, when you're 10 people on a Zoom call, versus, you know, when Bitcoin is at $69,000 and you have a thousand people on a Zoom call. Right. And, and I think that um, my best relationships and most trustworthy relationships were made in difficult times. Um, and when you see uh, certain leaders of our space, let me give you an example. The chairman of Animoca Brands, um, who's one who was named the most um, you know, a uh, powerful person in Web3. Uh, I get to interview him uh, in Singapore and another conference uh, and do the one-on-one -on -one interviews. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the reason, uh, and, and often, you know, he, he I often surprised to see some person who, who called me and I'm like, oh, how did you get my number? And they says, oh, he, he's the one who suggested that, that I should talk. So clearly he's, he's been uh, m mentioning my, my name. Uh, and, and then I realized that, well, the reality is that these relationships were built during bear markets, you know, mm -hmm. when there's nobody around the table and nobody wants to go for it because the future is uncertain. That's where you get noticed by the by the by the community. And, and I think that there was an interesting book that I read called The Formula is that 
success is not made by an individual, but it's people around you who make you successful. It's other people that says, hey, you should talk to that guy or, you know, that's the guy that can solve the, the problem. And, and I realized that, you know, um, the trustworthy element is the commitment element, is the fact that, you know, um, you say what, you know, you're going to do, but at the same time that you're going to be in the room and you're not going to disappear when times get tough. And I think that there's a big lesson around that. What an amazing insight. Yeah, I can uh, echo that in my own career. And I think we've uh, seen that play out so many times. There's people who just, they're, they're chasing the, the latest and greatest fad, the hottest thing. They're there because there's a flash in the pan. And actually it's the advice I've given people who are looking to learn about this space and other spaces. Anytime that you're in an emerging technology, a new technology on the cutting edge, like, man, you have got to have the commitment. You have got to be able to be there because you're passionate about it. Be able to have strong hands through those big swings. Um, because if, if you're just chasing a fad, uh, you're going to get wiped out, right? And I, I have witnessed it time and time again um, where the going gets tough and then people are like, yeah, I'm out. Um, and it, it, is, it makes it for, for, for an investor, that is very, very difficult, right? You end up making bad decisions at the absolute worst time. Um, you mentioned a book here. And I, I'd, I'd love to get any insight that you have on books that you've read recently. It could be business related or uh, in any any type of topic that you've found helpful for you as a leader, uh, as a uh, business person, or someone who is you know an investor into what these various Web three projects. The, the, this last book was the formula. Are there, are there any others that you would recommend? Yeah, so um, let's say in, in three different genres. I tend to leave three. I read three books. Uh, uh, at the time, and, and and I usually try to make it as opposite uh, as uh, as as possible. I, I'm oh, the I type of guy when I go to to Las Vegas. Uh, the first day I'm a, a UFC fight, and the next day at the Celine Dion concert. You know, with, with my <laughs> so, so I, I'm doing a little bit the same thing with, with books, and uh, so uh, that I'm going to give you the three books that I'm reading right now. Yeah. Uh, so that might not be my my three. Uh, books of all times, but these are yeah. the three right now. Uh, the first one is uh, well, a New York bestseller book, which is Outlive uh, from Dr. Peter Atias. Mm -hmm. uh, so the capacity to, um, you know, to, to uh, th that book uh, is basically the basis for me to understand about prevention, medicine 3.0, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and how um, do we have not only extend life, but extend your quality of life. And that changed mm -hmm. also my workout regime because he tells you about the hundred years old workout. So in an, I used to do workouts, you know, based, you know, every three months on a schedule. Now I look at what do I want to be my objective a hundred years old. And if I want to be able to, you know, walk five miles at a hundred years old, how many miles do I need to uh, um, uh, run today uh, at my age? So it kind of put a, a very different perspective. Um, the second book that I'm uh, right uh, that I'm um, reading uh, is the hit, the um, the biography of Fifty Cent, uh, the rapper, yeah. uh, which 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 is um, uh, quite quite um, well. First of all, I mean, going against all odds like like he did uh, with the success that that he had, and and the fact that um, you realize that nothing happens by chance. Uh, although he might have a, an image of uh, you know somebody who enjoys life, uh, the work ethic. It just it just off the charts as far as you know what uh, what, what he pushes out there uh, and uh, and and how he does uh, and how he does things. So uh, I, I was I was um, extremely um, I had a lot of learnings in in mm -hmm. that book. And, and the other one, which is uh, I, I guess my my January read um, is uh, is again another classic one, but I like to revisit it uh, at early in the year. Is Atomic Habits. Mm -hmm. uh, and the power and, and the power of, uh, you know, obviously putting habits together. And one of my favorites say uh, in, in it is uh, the concept of uh, never break the streak. So, for example, when I don't feel like going to the gym, they say in the book, well, you actually go to the gym, you do one push up and you leave. And, you know, even though you didn't have the full workouts because you're sick, you don't feel like it. The fact that you go back to your spreadsheet and you put a little X to it mentally, you're still in the game. And I think that 
um, it, it's also a, a, a metaphor in, in life. You you always want to stay in, in the game, no matter uh, how difficult the situation. Oh, those are three phenomenal books. I can't wait to put those in the show notes. And uh, I'm actually in the middle of reading uh, Peter, uh, Outlive as well. So uh, taking lots of notes on that. It, it feels like there's this m this movement globally. Uh, with uh, longevity, right? There's there's this resurgence in uh, all sorts of new science, new things that are coming out to help people, you know, understand their bodies and how to uh, live longer and healthier. Uh, and so that that is an absolute uh, phenomenal book. You know, you're a global traveler. You're, you're you're all over the world. What are some of the things? Do you have any hacks that you have uh, for yourself to stay at optimal performance? Uh, physical fitness and, and health is extremely important to you, but I'm just curious if you've learned over the years, whether through mentors or just through your own uh, trial and error, things that you do as you're traveling uh, to, to stay fit and stay healthy. Obviously, you just said here a second ago, you know, don't break the streak. So you're very committed uh, to your workout regimen. But anything else that you've you know discovered along the way? Yeah, so 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 I would say a um, co couple of things that that I try to be ve very good at. Some of them might be uh, basic, um, um, like um, the fact that uh, I my alcohol consumption is very limited, uh, mm -hmm. despite being in the in you know having a, a family in the in the wine business. Uh, I guess that might have given me discipline also uh, to to you know focus more on the work side of it than the drinking side of it. Um, so, so I think alcohol consumption has been uh, very key. And, and the other thing is that, um, and again, that sounds a little bit basics, but uh, what is being offered is not a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And and it is to understand um, where you at with your with your health. And I realize that a lot of people uh, don't know the food that they're allergic to, uh, so they might actually go towards the the, the wrong type of. Uh, nutrients they don't know what the supplement said they don't know what their blood levels are like um so i think that you know putting a, a little bit of um uh understanding of you know where you're currently uh i think uh hel helps a lot and i remember a, a friend told me once um you're uh you're only you're only the ceo of one thing in your life and it is your health mm. um and I, and I think that uh, if you're the CEO, whether it's a company or your health, you need to be a little bit more data focused and not not too much about, you know, gut feelings and, you know, the latest diet of the moment. But like, do you know your numbers with your health? And I think that's uh, the first step uh, to, uh, to, to get into. That's great advice. Absolutely spectacular. All right. Um, as we're coming to a close, and I'm so thankful for the time that you've invested with us today, uh, I do have a question that is on uh, my mind, and I'd, I'd love to get your insight and advice for someone who has uh, been watching this space. They've they they've wanted to kind of put their toes in the water. They've wanted to test it out. I'm gonna I'll actually tell you. Um, I, I get this question quite frequently, and I'll, I'll share with you what I've been saying. Tell me if uh, where I am right or where I am wrong with this advice, and then what your advice would be. Right. So we know that like close to maybe less than five percent, I've heard of the global population has a digital wallet. We're at the very early phases of adoption globally, so. Um, there's a lot of people left that are needing to uh, learn about the space. And so for me uh, personally, when people have been asking me, hey, Bob, where should I go? What should I do? I'll be like, you know what? One of the, if you're specifically in you know, domestic U.S., one of the places I'll send people, it's so easy. You know, you can go out, you can open up a Coinbase account with a couple clicks of a button. Um, you know, take a look at, you know, two of the, the, the best in, um, places to look at in terms of projects. Bitcoin and Ethereum are the, you know, the, the two uh, big projects globally that most people have heard. And I, I try to get them to do some uh, due diligence on those. And then maybe, you know, dig a little bit deeper on other types of projects that are solving a real world problem like you mentioned earlier. Where is that advice either right or wrong? And what would what would you also add or tell people that are looking to get involved in cryptocurrencies, blockchain technology, and start to learn and get some exposure? Where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, so so I think I think the so I come across two types of, of people. There's the people who 
um, who want to be in the industry, who want to work in the industry, either starting a business from scratch, that tends to be, you know, more the, the younger generations, or some of them who want to pivot some of their business and says, hey, we're a Web2 company, how do we become a Web3 company? So from an industry standpoint, that's, that's a set of, of different um, of, of different answers uh, mm -hmm. attached to it. For investors, I, I would say that that now um, there used to be friction and a reason why not to invest. You know, oh, I don't want to hold my tokens on a cold wallet. I don't trust myself of holding it. I don't know what to buy, et cetera, which, which tends to be true. But now we're in an ETF world. Now you have the biggest, you know, companies, um, you know, uh, financial institutions in the world offering a product at a very low fee. Uh, mm -hmm. right, right now, you have under 1% fee and you can get exposure to Bitcoin without having to worry about, you know, uh, what is my CPA going to think? What is my legal team going to think? Um, mm -hmm. You know, what is my broker going to think? So I would say like this is the first um, the, the, the first um, uh, way to get in the space. And there's speculation that there might be an Ethereum ETF also be approved in, in the future. So I would say people who are on day one of their journey, the, the most important is to get exposure, not solely from a financial return, but getting exposure to get the feel of it, to be mm -hmm. interested in it, to feel what the swings are like. And actually with time, the swings are going to be less and less. And what we see is that, you know, when, you know, they start being more interested, that hopefully the price goes up, uh, then the level of interest uh, goes from, a, you know, a line item on their, you know, portfolio to now starting to spend time. And then, you know, there's the natural evolution of becoming a crypto maxi at the end. Mm -hmm. and, and we saw this, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, um, on TV with, you know, Shark Tank and Kevin O'Leary, who says, not ever my dead body, I would I would ever invest in crypto. And now who's going on CNBC, how, you know, how crypto and Bitcoin is the greatest thing in the world. Um, so so you, you have those almost those five stages of grief that you have to go through. And, and then you arrive to a place where you're like, well, actually, it kind of makes sense. And it's everybody's journey is different. And there's a famous say that um, you get Bitcoin at the price that you deserve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you see some of them got it, uh, you know, early, some of them getting at, you know, 42,000 like today. And some and the majority will get over it when it's over $100,000. And then mm -hmm. you'll have the map coming into it. And, you know, I, I guess it's the it's the risk reward ratio uh, at the end of the day. Well, I tell, tell you what, it's it's not just Kevin O'Leary, but you take a look at all the investment bankers and um, big bank CEOs and Wall Street that, you know, called uh, all of this, this entire space rat poison a few years ago. And now all of a sudden, I mean, they're they're you know on CNBC, they're on Squawk Box and all these other uh, shows and they're touting it like this is a great investment opportunity. Can't wait. We want to have it be a part of our portfolio. And now they're trying to get investors to come. So it's amazing, you know, the dichotomy and uh, how their opinions have radically changed in the, in the space of a couple of years. So it, it is going to be so interesting to see how this develops. Uh, it is such a dynamic and, and quickly moving space. Uh, and I can't wait to have you back on where you can give more of your insights. Uh, where can people uh, follow you uh, that are wanting to, you know, follow you on socials? And, you know, you have a, a new company where you are investing in Web 3.0 companies. Uh, you're doing a lot of fascinating things. So uh, let's make sure that all of our listeners know exactly where they can follow you and continue to learn from you. Yeah. So so on the more uh, on the more corporate side is uh on LinkedIn, on the Hervé Loren, H-E-R-V-E uh, Loren, uh, or uh, for the more Web3 native uh, DGENs, as we call them, then it would be on the, on Twitter. Uh, and that, it's spelled Hervé differently. It's my phonetic name, my name on the metaverse, which is A-I-R-V-E-Y, Hervé, the, the actual pronunciation of it. My Twitter handler, handling is still um, uh, at Hervé Loren underscore, uh, but the name on it is uh, is uh, A I R V Y, and you'll see the picture of my board ape as my profile picture, as my profile pic, as my PFP, 
as, the, no, as they call it. That's awesome. Well, I, well, I'll make sure to put links to both of those locations in the show notes so people can easily find that. And one of the, the questions that I have been uh, asking our guests uh, over the last year, year and a half, and I, I can't wait to get your insight on this. I didn't give you a heads up on this, but I'm sure if, having listened to some of the, the previous episodes, you know the question that's coming. I mean, we, we live in a really interesting time. We, uh, time uh, globally, it's not just here in the United States, but all around the globe where it feels like you know we've come out of the pandemic. We've got economic issues. We've got places around the globe where there are active wars. We've got places around the globe where there's threat of war. But it feels like Everywhere I go and every single person I talk to, there's there, there's a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of stress. There's a little bit of worry. Uh, you know, people were, were just living in some interesting times. And I like to talk to leaders specifically who are global leaders traveling and interfacing with people uh, with very diverse backgrounds. And I ask them this one question. Let's pretend that uh, President Biden here within the United States uh, called you up and said, you know what? I want you to give a State of the Union address to the American people, but let's also pretend, in your case, since uh, you are a global leader, that th this is a, a message that the world is going to hear. It's going to be broadcast around the globe. Uh, and I want you, to, uh, Hervé, I want you to give a word of encouragement, a word of hope and optimism, um, something to inspire uh, individuals. Uh, what would you say? It's an interesting question. Um... Uh, it did get, caught, caught me off guard. Uh, I've missed it on the, on the previous uh, podcast. But I, I, I would say in terms of, um, you know, vote of, in, of encouragement, you know, it, it's interesting because, you know, the, these types of, of questions, we can, we can always, you know, the, the typical is, is the war elements and, you know, insecurity in, in, in general, um, et cetera. Um, I, 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 would, I would say... Um, I would say the, the, there's a couple of interesting things. The, the, the first one, um, I would say that we often focus on the things that go wrong, but when you look at the data, we have to focus on the things that go right. And when you look now, you actually have less violent death than ever before in, in the world. And I think that, you know, we're, and to attach it to the, the, the you know, my, my industry is now, now we're living in a more, collaborative world. I feel that the 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 world where I sit is more is more you know is is flatter and therefore there's there's more interactions and more the capacity to solve to solve problems. Um, so I would say to continue collaborating um, you know in between in between countries and you know that's gonna raise you know the the level of um, the level of um, you know the, the the level of um, you know just wealth you know through, throughout the different through different economies. So um, you know I I think that uh, I'd rather focus on on the positive than than in, than in the negative. So well, I, th I think it's a you know I, I love the fact that you took a moment of pause to think and really analyze it. You know, some people just, you know, kind of rush in and want to give a, maybe a half-baked answer, but I think it's a sign of uh, you being an intellectual. To, and it was the first time in, in, the, in this interview where uh, there was a question where like, you know what, hey, let me let me take a moment of pause here and think about it because it, it's, a, it, it's an important topic. And uh, I really, I, I liked the fact that you had that intellectual honesty. I'm just like, hey, I want to take a moment of pause. I'm going to think about this. And I think what you, you hit on something that's extremely important, which is the more that we collaborate together, the more that we find out that we are more alike than we are different. And I think that's one of the things that I really relished about you know, our time at HBS and the, 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 the very diverse group of individuals that were part of our class that... Um, man, we're so many different religions, so many different backgrounds, uh, so many different views on the world and on life and on social issues of the day. But at the end of the day, in an environment where we were very open with each other and transparent, uh, very honest, uh, and in a, in a space where dialogue um, and uh, sharing different beliefs was welcomed and encouraged, what we ended up finding is that we may disagree on certain topics, but at the end of the day, we had a lot more in common than we had differences. And part of that was you, the, the, the word that you, you, you came to as you were thinking, it was like collaboration. You're collaborating as a leader with leaders all over the globe, 
on these projects and collaboration builds trust. Collaboration builds unity and it builds a shared vision for the future. And I feel that the more um, that we are able to do that, the more that we'll be able to come together as opposed to be divided and pulled apart. And I, I love, uh, I cannot wait to hear more of your uh, roles and uh, these committees and these boards that you're on globally. Uh, I, I feel like the, the leadership challenge that you are being presented and the things that you are learning, I mean, obviously, all of these things are interesting in terms of you know Web 3.0 and the blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies and so forth. But I, I think that you actually, and, uh, and I, this would be a request that I would have for you, make sure you're taking really good notes on your leadership journey. Because I think that you, you and people like you that are in, in these roles, you're actually crafting a new leadership narrative um, for the next generation leader, the next generation politician. I think that with just as the technology world is rapidly expanding and new um, revolutions in front of us in terms of innovation, I think that the old world, we'll call it web um, we'll call it we'll call it politics 2.0. I think politics 2.0 needs to move into politics 3.0. It's we need a different type of leader in Washington D.C., in Moscow, in London, in Paris, in Caracas, right in Cape Town, um, that is looking uh, at the world through a different lens, uh, through collaboration. Uh, and I think that like so here you are um, in a project that's allowing you to lead in that capacity. And I think that you're going to learn a lot and be able to inspire the next generation leader, not just in Web 3.0 projects, but also in politics as well. It's, it, it, it's a sneaking suspicion that I have. I could be wrong, but I think that you, you're doing a marvelous job in doing that. And I'm, uh, I'm hopeful that I think what the world needs is a different type of leader in these positions of power in politics. And <laughs> I just called it politics 3.0, but whatever it is, but I, I think collaboration brings out the best in all of us. And you build trust. And Hervé, you're doing a wonderful job. Uh, you motivate and inspire me. I just want to say thank you for uh, having the courage back in 2013, 2014, to stand up in front of a class at Harvard and tell everybody about this. And when everybody's eyes were a little bit like, what in the world is he talking about? What's this black box at the, at the front of the classroom, this minor? And you stood there with conviction. You stood there with passion. And some people in that room got it. And it took other people a few years before they fully grasped it and understood it. But you've been at the cutting edge for a very long time, my friend. You're doing a great job. Uh, you're being uh, recognized by leaders all across the globe for your incredible work in Web 3.0. It's an honor to call you a friend. And thank you for motivating and inspiring me and our audience today. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and, and thank you for having me. It means a lot. Thank you. It's a blessing. We will definitely have you back soon, my friend. Thank you. I can't wait. Today's episode was engineered by Mitch White with graphic and marketing by Tristan White. Special thanks to Hervé for investing time to share with our listeners his story and learnings from his journey. Make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, or if you're an Android user, check us out on Spotify or wherever you go to listen to your favorite pods. If you like the show, please share it with a friend and give us a review. That's always appreciated. Thank you for spending time with us today, and we look forward to seeing you again next week.